Hey y'all, new day, new verse. We continue on in Isaiah. Today we're going to be kicking up with chapter 55, verse 10. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for the understanding. Lord, keep technology from melting away. Do this. Keep us save alive in you, Lord. Get hot for those who need hot. Cold for those who need cold. Dryness for those who need it. And fresh rains for those who need it, Lord God. We surrender it to your hand, trusting that you are good, O oh Lord God. We worship you and praise you. Amen. Chapter 55, verse 10. The rain and snow come down from the heavens and stay on the ground to water the earth. They cause the grain to grow, produce seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. I wanted to take a moment here because, like, you know, he continues on like we went through with the reading that just his, his, his words are the same. And we're going to dig into that tomorrow, and I love it. I want to take a pause here because I love the absolute profundity. You know, and there's certain areas and places where you're like, oh, well, it talks about this, and see, it's antiquated, it did time and place. This text is thousands of years old. Like, the Jewish calendar, keeping tradition over 3,000 years at this point. This story is longer than all of us. The Roman Empire doesn't have a thing on this existence on this story, on this length of time. And so when I think about these words right here, I also think about the words that God gave to Moses, to the children of Israel during the time of the Exodus. I'm taking you into a land flowing with milk and honey. It's not one like the, where you're from, with the, where you come from with Egypt, where you know Nile waters everything. You have to irrigate, what have you. No, no, no. The water in this land comes down from the skies. The, this land that you're going into is a place where absolutely every opportunity is a chance to see God's provision at work, God's hand active and at work. And that beautiful moment of presence of the invisible God who's always working things. That same idea that Paul takes and extrapolates on and says, hey, you have a perfect example of this. When your bellies were full and you were rested and contented, when you were in a state of bliss and nothing can get better. You have proof of it. The heart is in the, de the longing for eternity is in the human heart. The existence, or the source of existence itself. The one who is outside of eternity put it there. So that we could understand we're meant for something more. Something deeper than the silly childish games we get lost in and stuck in. And I love these beautiful places like these, uh, these texts that don't just show the intricacy of God saying, well, yeah, of course this is how the system works. I made it. I made it so that it was a closed system. I made it so that the water would continually flow from the mountains into the sea. The sea would never fill up, to borrow from Solomon and Ecclesiastes, all the way, continue and repeating doing. The, these words that were written to ancient peoples when compared to their counterparts at the time, Code of Hammurabi, what have you, they're downright bleeding edge progressive. And when actually taking the idea at the core that all humanity is created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I know it's the borrowed from the, you know, foundational text of the United States, but where do you think we got it from? There are no new ideas under the sun. Even Hamlet, or Lion King's borrowed from Hamlet, which he stole out of here. Yeah, Kings, it's a fun story. Go have fun. All of this story, all of this text that predates us by so much and yet is so actively and intimately involved even today. The missionaries around the world working their tails off to remind people in desolate places that the other matters, the least of these are called home and that if you think you're a nobody, God says you're my somebody. You are my own. I love you. I adore you. I will never let you go. That is what our Father says, our Father in Heaven continually. That He is ruthless with the dead wood, especially because it tends to kill plants when left there. And remarkably, remarkably gentle with the living wood. Not snuffing out a candle flame. Not breaking away. Gentle with the reeds that are under strain until they are mighty as cedars. Is, is that not the very idea borrowed from Talmud, right? Rigid as cedar, supple as reeds, because we're shaped by him. So that when we take moments of seeing, wow, you painted the stars in the sky, you created the water system, you painted and actively paint the galaxies, the sunsets, the moon, the stars, 
the brilliant cosmos and nebula is out and about the intricacies of quarks and atoms, protons, the space in between spaces, those liminal places that boggle the mind. He is there over all of them. And when we use our muchness, he refines it. We understand that it's just about receiving. There's nothing we can do. It's nothing to do with who we are. It is simply to receive, such as the nature is a gift. And that very gift is the thing that should keep us all humble because it reminds us everyone is invited. Not a select group of people, not one or select few. The remnant is chosen, absolutely. But I look at this text and I see that less thing to do with acting the bloodline and more to do with a humble heart that understands, wait, I'm loved like this. I should love others. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I have told you, human, what is good, to live justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. There are not massive amounts of rules, even the 1613 that were given through the journey around Sinai. We're banking a point. You can't legislate morality. The more you try to, the more it rebels. Something fundamentally has to change in the human heart. And that's what God does. He fundamentally changes us from the inside out, not the outside in. Outside in is conformity. From the inside out, that's transformation. That's a renewed creation. And that's the beauty of it. It's all receiving the act of mercy, the act of sacrifice, the act that says, I will die in your stead. That's it. That is all we have to focus on is him. Because when we do, we live. Even these very beautiful things, the rains and snow coming down from the heavens, staying on the ground to water the earth, enriching it, filling it, making it whole. They causing the grain to grow, producing seed for the farmer so that the farmer can be involved with his munchness, watching it grow, cultivating, playing, having fun, and then boom, bread for the hungry. Because everyone is actively and intimately involved, the whole body, everybody. Working together. We're not against each other. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. I mean, if we can, can't understand that all of humanity is related, how are we supposed to get along as believers? And yet the sad part is we as believers are supposed to be spearheading the way so that those who do not believe can have the chance to understand that everyone is made by him. It's the choices we make and continue to make that separate us. The choices that say, I want my own will, instead of the will of the one who makes the universe. And it's not an, oh, I want to give up my free will. It's an, you know, I'm tired of this going off in my face. Yeah, I'm, I'm tired of holding on to the bottle rocket or the not firecracker and forgetting to let go. I, I'm tired of watching the dumpster fire that is my life spectacularly roar and burn. And the only thing I can do is roast marshmallows and smell the tire fire. I'm tired of that. If you're tired of that too, which, let's face it, in the world we live in, I can't imagine you're not. That's what he does. From the place of dumpster fire of my own will, my own choices, my own way, to understanding, oh, that's how I do it? That's how I can live in love. But that makes sense, so logically, to this world. But digging in, in this world is a stay over in a tumble-down shack. So, why would I treat a B and b like my forever home? It's not, but we do when we're here. We get so obsessed with the bread as the hungry, we forget who is the source of actual bread. I'm reminded of a quote, I don't remember where I heard it, but it made me smile. God is always making water into wines. It was at the wedding in Cana that he decided not to let anyone else get involved. And even then, it's not necessarily completely accurate because the servants got to hand it out. I love the idea there, though, that water, the grapes, the seed, the vine, the farmer, the vineyard, the cobbler who creates, or not cobbler, um, I know there's a technical term for um, vat makers, something with a C. Anyway, it'll come to me. But every single one of these people involved. Every single person, the person who cultivates the barley, the wheat, the yeast, the grapes, the blah, 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 blah. The trees that become the wood, the metal that becomes the carver for the flask, for the cask, the uh, 
person who puts it, he digs out the hole so it can ferment correctly. Whatever the booze may be, alcohol if you prefer, whatever it may be, everyone's muchness is involved. The wedding in Cana, he said, no, 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 let me make the point. And still the servants were involved. Does that not, if anything, show that God is actively and intimately involved in spending time with each of us? The muchness for each of us. The whole body working together. So it takes a lot of hands to make a cup of wine. It takes a lot of hands to do anything. We just become so detracted from it, from our massive industrialized life then we miss it and don't get me wrong i'm not knocking it my favorite thing to do on minecraft is to build machines so that i don't have to go farm <laughs> i could dig up the the potato but pull ever no i don't not knocking it but i recognize that in over industrialization we get detached from it there's a reason there's so many social experiments about getting people to recognize the sacrifice of the animal when it comes to production of meat. Or to actually think about just how involved we have an effect on things. It's not aloof. It's not detached. That's master behavior. Servants are intimately involved. And we are called to, called to cultivate the world. We are called to cultivate the garden, to work for the benefit of the Babylon we are in while we wait for the Lord's return. Guess what? They're all Babylon. United States, Panama, Mexico, and the whole damn lot of them. They're all Babylon. All of them. They inevitably become it. Inevitably. Unless they are firmly, foundationally built on him. Israel, United States, Russia, China, Iraq, Iraq, pick them all. Any place that promotes its own people, position, and power over the sake of another group is Babylon. Any place that is built on the back of another human being is Babylon. Because it's made for that one person to suffer, that group to suffer. Made to suffer. Not the willing choice of, hey, I'll do it. But the forced way of doing it. Slavery by another name. And I want to call it out because we get so intimately connected to the Babylon that we're in that it becomes borderline nationalism and suddenly we're able to do some of the worst atrocities known to man. For what? Dirt? A land mass that's made up of your great-great-great-great-great-great-grand relatives? Matter can neither create it nor destroy it. Energy can neither created nor destroy it means we are each made up of the body parts of something else. Starlight and Stardust is a nice and pretty way to look at it. But the core of it? So instead of focusing on the pharaoh pile, missing the fact that we're all future worm poop, as far as the physical sense is concerned, but hey, entropy, so is the universe itself. How about we focus on what actually does matter? People. Those precious moments that will never come again. Those conversations that embody such beauty. Those interactions that give us a reminder of laughter and joy and smiles. Those places where we can be sorrowful with those who are sorrowful and rejoice with those who rejoice. I mean, hell, there's a reason in Inside Out that uh, joy is crowned with sorrow. Her hair is literally blue. God is always inviting us. Always encouraging us to seek him. Always asking us to shed the silliness of the old life. The old obsessions, the old directions. The ones that run on our own GPS. Instead, look at the birds and live carefree in the love of God. When he says, hey, go do this because you're supposed to, we listen and respond. Knowing that his way, it's not our way of doing it, yet he knows. That's trust. Not a blind faith obedience of, oh, I'm going to do it because the voice told me to. No, it's the being who created me is looking out for me. Like any good parent. How many out there? Because we've all been kids to somebody. How many of us can think of a time it is a kid where we wished, oh, I wish I had actually listened to my parent. I wish I had actually heard what that authority figure had said. Well, here is the source of your life and reality itself saying, I will make you whole if you will just listen. How many parents have said that one? Or some variation of, if you will just listen. 
He's a good, good father just waiting for us to listen. The question is, will we? And it's a damned important one. Because he's a respecter of that choice. We will either have his will or our own. If we have his will, we may hold. Shalom. Telios. Perfect. If we have our own, then we will continue to be Picasso people, trying to figure out where the mouth, arms, and shoulders go. Because we don't know what we're supposed to look like. Because we've lost sight of the ones whose image we hold. May his favor be upon you. Know that you're loved. I'll see you then.